Okay, I, I think it would be, uh, I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, it's great to see such a, a big crowd here, but I know it's not for me. I'm, I'm David Pumphrey. I'm the uh, Deputy Director and Senior Fellow with the Energy and National Security Program here at CSIS. And it's always a great pleasure to have my good friend, I was going to say old friend, but I don't know that that's the right term, Faridun. A um, friend of long uh, standing, um, Faridun Feshiraki here to uh, talk with us. And it's, it's been really interesting. This is, I think, the fourth time that we've had, had you here. And I think the crowd gets bigger every time. So um, it's really great. You can tell that everyone is very uh, interested in what you have to say. Um, Faridun's biography, for those of you who don't know him, and I think most of the crowd here does know him, um, is, is available. Uh, and I think it's really a remarkable um, history from the, his early days in the, the Iranian government to then moving to Hawaii and starting a uh, energy program, looking at um, Asia in particular and trying to penetrate into the midst of the energy policy circles and really moving that into a very successful consulting business that looks worldwide. So I think that your knowledge and experience will benefit us uh, today. The topics for Faridun's conversation were China and India's energy policy directions with a little bit of discussion about Iran. And this came about after we tried to narrow down on what we should have Faridun talk about because there's so many things. So I would encourage you, if you have any questions on energy globally, go ahead and think those up too and we'll hit him with uh, additional questions in the Q&A. So with that, Faridun, why don't you proceed? Thank you very much, uh, Dave. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I was told, you know, Washington is a town of cynics, so unless you give lunch to people, they don't come. But uh, I am uh, very impressed that so many of you have turned up. Uh, uh, my job is to entertain you and amuse you and give you a few facts in between. Um, the topics are very wide, and uh, we were just talking that, you know, I have 47 uh, uh, slides here, and. Uh, if I want to go through each of them one by one, you'll be here until 6 p.m. So I will jump across them and I try to sort of uh, uh, compare and contrast India and uh, I'll talk about a little bit about what uh, they are doing in Iran. And uh, as Dave said, um, uh, you should feel free to ask questions on any topic uh, as long as it's not about uh, specific retail stations in Arizona. I should be able to, be able to say something. Um, let me first start by saying that something uh, about you know, comparing China and India from the perspective of an analyst. Uh, if we look at the, the, the incremental growth for oil demand in the world and also for natural gas, you have uh, three countries, three areas standing uh, up to, to, to show the, the, the power to you. Number one is China. and. Uh, Annual growth in China has been significant. We expect it to remain in the 400,000 barrels per day a year incremental growth over the next eight to 10 years, and then significantly slow down, and I'll tell you why. After China is not India, actually, is the countries of the Persian Gulf. Persian Gulf countries, they grow by about 300,000 barrels per day a year, 250, 300,000 barrels per day. And India, about 100 to 150,000 barrels per day. So uh, China and India should not surprise you. They're big countries, they're growing countries, and dynamic economies. But the countries in the Persian Gulf are, add them all together, you know, sort of even including the large population country like Iran, uh, they're still pretty small. Uh, but why are they growing so fast is because the price of oil is next to nothing. And the uh, incomes are high, and the population is 70% under the age of 30. So sort of a dynamic criteria for a massive growth in, in, in uh, energy demand. Uh, but in China and India, it is very much, I think, the the industry, the economy, and the way that the system is organized, which is leading to, to the growth. So India, about a third to 40% of the Chinese growth rate is what we expect. The systems are set up in uh, relatively similar ways. Uh, there are multiple national oil companies in both countries. These national companies are very rich and very powerful. 
Uh, in China, the three state oil companies uh, this year are expected to make $45 billion of net profit. I mean, that will put to shame a lot of the big companies. They don't have to pay taxes. They don't have to give the money to the government. They keep the money. As long as they can invest it properly, the government let them keep it. And this is why you find a great deal of aggressiveness and uh, brave strategies in going international acquisition as well as domestic expansions. India, similar, uh, but smaller scale, much smaller scale. But you have very uh, aggressive uh, activities by India, except that the Indian companies, they don't make that amount of money. And some of them, in fact, are, uh, have to be subsidized because of the losses they suffered in the downstream sector, retail sector. Both countries kept the prices below the international market for a long time. China came out of that. And in fact, in China, there is a schedule that unless the price of oil goes above $130 a barrel, the government will not intervene to fix the prices. But above $80, there are uh, moderation systems in place. But you can still have higher prices for petroleum products, even at above $80 crude. Both India and China have undertaken significant reforms. Last month was an amazing month. India and China both have raised the price of natural gas substantially. But India doubled the price of natural gas from the administered pricing mechanism, the APM, cheap prices they had. And they have raised the price of petroleum products to the point that in China and India today, gasoline prices are above the, at, at, at around the international prices. So they have done substantial uh, actions to try to bring things in balance with the world market. So in China, the oil companies drive government policy. In India, the government drives the oil company policies. So the state companies, the big giants which operate in these two countries, are not the same. The Chinese ones are much more powerful and much stronger. If they want something really done, they will put it, couch it in the terms of uh, security, and they will pull the government with themselves who will use their muscle to sign the contracts on their behalf. In India, the government has to tell the companies what to do. So the roles are not quite the same. The Chinese are much more powerful in the area. The provincial authorities in China are a lot more powerful than the provincial authorities in India. But the direction and the importance of both of the countries remain the same. So again, as I mentioned, this is going to be uh, available from CSIS. Uh, uh, and I'm not going to go through every chart. I will jump on a, across very fast. But I wanted to show you just a few things. One thing is that don't count, uh, hold your breath about uh, significant reduction in coal use in China. It still remains very large, though it's taken a big change from 70% to 60%, and we expect it probably to go down to 50%. But coal remains very important. Gas is slated for massive increases, both by domestic production as well as through uh, imports, where uh, China has now become a big, important global player as far as gas is concerned. Oil remains important. The growth rate of, for oil in China will be sustained for the next many years, but there is a huge debate in China today about bringing oil demand under control. In fact, it's the number one issue, to my mind, today, of how to create peak demand in China. And I think that is coming. The government has uh, mooted now 12 and a half million barrels per day as a ceiling for oil demand in 2020, and to keep it that way. And uh, of course, you can't be precise about these things. But uh, they are a determined lot, so when they want to do something, I believe they have the tools at their disposal to bring the demand uh, very close to what they are hoping. So they certainly, uh, we have moderated significantly our forecast of the demand growth in China. You know, the economists, uh, and uh, I am guilty of that, uh, forecasting demand is very easy. Just give me two points of history of GDP and one elasticity, and I'll forecast anything for you. Don't, don't ever ask me where the supply comes from, because that's not my job. It's the geologist. So uh, 
forecasting demand growth in China has become a, a bit of a stupid game, I think, that people just have this incredible growth rates going on forever. So China becomes bigger than the U.S. and becomes double the size of the U.S. If everybody in China drives a car, then everybody in the U.S. has to walk. There is not enough oil in the world to accommodate some of these forecasts. But the people who do the forecast, they don't actually care about where the supply comes from. So whoever does forecasting for you anywhere, please tell him, show me where the supply comes from. Hold them to it. And in the case of China, the Chinese government understands that. That is why they realize that if they keep growing, their own action will remain, make sure that the price of oil goes up and the energy security will be in trouble. So because of that, they have taken deliberate measures. And they are taking deliberate measures to try and bring the demand under control. So maybe they cannot do it at 12 and a half, maybe with 13 or 14. Maybe the growth rate will not be zero, be only 50, 100,000 barrels per day. But uh, it is a high priority issue and it's something that I believe they intend to do and they can do. And it should enter our calculations as we look at the future of demand in China. This is the who is who of the Chinese oil industry. A complicated story, but actually uh, quite uh, logical. You can see the big boys. This is the CNPC PetroChina, CNOC, and Sinopec. Then you have the fourth one, Sinochem, China Oil here, and Unipec are the trading arms of Sinopec and uh, uh, CNPC. This is a company, Genrong, which is only authorized to buy oil from Iran. This company is only formed with four trading from I with Iran. Now, because other companies objected, uh, anything more than 250,000 barrels per day that they purchase, after they buy 250,000 barrels per day, then other Chinese companies can also approach Iran for volume. But before that, you cannot. And so many people ask the question, well, the Chinese are working in Iran to bring, bring volume to China. Actually, if the Chinese company works in Iran, what they produce will have to go to general, not to them. And this is a company which came from the military, is now registered as a civilian company, and uh, it is a very important player, a very important player. And uh, uh, it is, has a mandate for the first quarter of a million barrels per day imports to be done through them. There is a, the government here is represented by, let's see, cannot make this move, oops. Okay. Okay, now I can make it move. NDRC, National Development Reform Commission, and the uh, NEC, NEO, these are the government apparatus in there which report to the Council of Ministers or State Council. Uh, but essentially, you have these giant enterprises which are very powerful and very strong and very rich. And they are both the tools of the state and the state is the tool of them. Uh, the principle, in my view, is that the uh, survival of the enterprise is more important than the state. So first, you focus on these companies. And the state is there to support them being very successful and being uh, globalized. And I will come and tell you how much oil they control around the world today. This is what I told you about the profits of the Chinese companies. These guys are really, really rich, uh, put to shame many of the international majors. Uh, I told you about demand, demand 6 or 7% growth, but this is expected to slow down significantly. Uh, I don't want to talk too much about refining capacity. The Chinese policy essentially is, I don't want to export, I don't want to import. But since I don't want to import, I may do too much exports. So some volume may go out of the country as balancing, but huge amount of capacity has been built in, in China and a huge amount is under construction. So we don't expect China to become a huge exporter of petroleum products because they don't want to. They just want to make sure that they produce enough for themselves. Now, I will tell you, India is very different. India has become a hub of refining exports. Today, India exports more refined products than Saudi Arabia. That uh, 
may come as a surprise to you, as a Singapore, which is the trading hub of the Asian market, but India is number one. That is part of a different kind of thinking and different kinds of policy. But uh, China still builds a lot. A lot of the people who supply technology, manufacturing, are uh, very keen, but the Chinese use mostly their own technology. They developed themselves during the years they were cut off. And the technology is pretty good. The level of sophistication of the Chinese refinery is only second in the world after the US. A lot more than it is in Japan or most of Europe. Oil product prices, uh, I mentioned to you, they have uh, managed a system now that uh, uh, as long as the prices are under $80, you can sell at the market level. Now, they will tell you what the market level is, but they're very, very close approximation of the market. Between $80 to $100, they have uh, some level of control. Between $100 to $130, a bit more control. After $130 oil, they keep the price flat. This is the current regulation. But uh, in China, for a period of time, the companies were losing a lot of money because the price of oil was, when it was $147, they kept it as if it was 80. And the government companies which lost money, end of the year, received a check from the government. And uh, they, uh, they were kept whole, but they had to wait a whole year for it. They didn't like it. Uh, some of them uh, started to export and uh, left the domestic market uh, not supplied, the government was not pleased. Uh, put their foot down, you can't export until you make sure the domestic market is supplied. But there is a sort of happy arrangement between the government and uh, the, the oil companies. There is no big tension, there is no big sort of conflict. Uh, more conflict in India than in, in uh, uh, China, particularly India because there is a robust and strong private sector operating. Uh, so the system has worked more and more moving to the free market. And uh, contrary to everybody's expectation, this is gonna slow down the demand. It hasn't happened. The demand is about the same as it was before. Almost unchanged at about four, 500,000 barrels per day growth a year, which scares the Chinese government itself. Who they want to see some level of control there. Uh, let me talk about where the Chinese get their oil. The Middle East is almost 50%, and Africa is 30%. Africa is very important because of number one, Angola, and then Sudan. Now, why do the Chinese like Angola very much? Because Angolan crude is very much, very similar to Chinese crude. It's heavy and it's sweet, and it fits the Chinese refineries very well. Uh, this last two weeks, China even, uh, the imports from Angola has gone higher than Saudi Arabia. But Essentially, this law is Saudi Arabia is number one, Angola is number two, and Iran is number three. That's how the system's kind of designed to. And uh, volumes going to Angola is imported by CNPC PetroChina because they are the ones which are owners of the refining system, which can handle uh, heavier, sweeter crude. Uh, what uh, comes from Saudi Arabia, Iran, Kuwait, Iraq goes mostly inside the Sinopec system, which is designed to handle sour crudes. Now, you will say, well, why would Venezuela want to say to sell uh, heavy crudes to CNPC PetroChina since they don't have a system to handle crudes? So that sort of uh, shows, uh, I think, uh, a level of uh, uh, lack of understanding of uh, who is who in China and what does, what the companies do. Because CNPC was in upstream business in Venezuela, that was seen to be by Venezuela to be the obvious choice. But actually, CNPC uh, and its public affiliate uh, PetroChina are the least able to handle the sour crews. The ones which who can handle it very well are the people in Sinopec. And uh, there is no the Chinese concept. If you deal with this group, the other group is not gonna deal with you. So as a result of this, uh, you really need to get large volumes from Venezuela into China, you need to have dedicated refinery built. And that is the plan. You know, build a 10, $12 billion, 400,000 barrels per day refinery. So you can make it work, but there are a massive uh, associated costs and de facto discounts which have to come to this system. So the volume they get from uh, Russia is also significant, but they get 
oil from Russia by train. It's amazing. These dedicated trains which just go from one spot to another spot. And so this is roughly their, their system, and it's highly unlikely that this level of buying in terms of the relationships change. Uh, as the growth comes, the same kind of people will be expected to supply. Saudi Arabia will go to a million barrels per day, uh, I expect within the next three, four years, when uh, they are likely to take a partnership or a special arrangement with the Qindao refinery in the Northeast and supply 200,000 barrels per day dedicated to that too. Essentially, Saudi Arabia becomes unchallengeable in the system, and now the Saudis have invested together with ExxonMobil in the refinery in Fujian province, which is already in operation for more than a year and a half. When we look at the outlook for imports, they will buy a lot more as time goes by. As, we, as you see, that we see their production as flat, not, not changing. Uh, so any kind of growth would have to go towards imports. So they become a bigger and bigger player as time goes by. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, the oil imports, you have potential of a refining surplus because they're building the refineries assuming the demand will come. But at the same time, they're putting their foot on the brake on the demand side. So that may end up giving them a surplus refineries. But uh, as of now, the policy is that we don't want to export. Uh, we will export what we have to as a balancing, but it is not a strategy for us to be in the product market. Strategic petroleum reserves, uh, the three phases, phase one, which ended in, in 2008, 103 million barrels, 31 days of uh, net imports and 15 days of total consumption in the four sites already completed and all the tanks were filled. They waited for the price of oil to go down and then they started to buy. The Chinese are very much sensitive to being accused of being a reason for the price of oil goes up. And of course, uh, uh, you know, many people want to blame somebody. Uh, used to blame OPEC and Saudi Arabia, but now blame the Chinese. Went up. And nobody says the reason the price of oil goes up is because I'm consuming too much oil myself. I should cut it back myself. And uh, if anybody mentions taxes, I'll try to assassinate him. So, so it, it is really sort of the Chinese are so sensitive. And they just want to wait until they see a lull in the price of oil before they start buying. And you know, the other day when uh, the IEA said China has become the largest energy consumer in the world, immediately they disputed IEA. No, I'm the second, US is first. I don't want to be the first here. This is a sort of a bad uh, position to be in. Uh, they don't mind being better than the Japanese or bigger than the Koreans, that's fine. But they don't want to be bigger than the US. The US has to be the uh, biggest one first so we can uh, not pass the blame to us. Uh, target phase two, 2012, th this is uh, 170 million barrels, uh, which brings a total to, to two, 272. Uh, 60 days of imports and 30 days of uh, total consumption. This one, uh, half done. And uh, 2000, the phase three, 2015-16, is to come up to a total of 500 million barrels of uh, SPRs which is what they intend to do, and I believe they will achieve it. But their buying is going to be very much affected by the price of oil. They don't want to be accused. The price of oil is going up. You started buying from them. That's why you've pushed the prices up. They don't want to be blamed for that. This is uh, the Chinese companies, how much oil they own around the world. This is the equity position. And uh, here are different players. And you can see, of course, in the blue is um, uh, PetroChina, uh, number one, of course, uh, in China and around the world, and the big upstream player. They own most of the assets, and number two in the green is Sinopec, and Sinoc is in uh, red, and others, including Sinochem, are above. So uh, as of 2009, almost 1.2 million barrels per day of equity owned they own around the world which I must tell you that it's a remarkable achievement. After 40 years, the Japanese could not come to one-sixth of that level. And in Korea, where there is a major effort by Korea National Corporation on the way, I think when there are uh, 300,000 barrels per day, would be sort of pretty much uh, the 
the likely upper ceiling in the, in the near term. But China is 1.2 already. And uh, different players, uh, this is not the kind of service contracts that they have in places like Iran. This is actually equity <coughs> oil. So very substantial. Now, where will this number go? Based on existing agreements signed, this will be about 1.5 million barrels per day by 2015. So it's a significant, even by international standards. And it comes from a strategy of acquiring what other people have found. The mistake in the Japanese strategy was to always try and like, find it yourself. And if you're not very good at it, then you can't find it. But let somebody else find it, and I'll just buy it. And I'll buy it for my $45 billion that if I don't spend, I may lose. So the Chinese policy has a great deal of logic inside it. And if it doesn't make sense to you, that's because you don't understand what, why they do what they do. But there is always a good reason for it. Every time I didn't understand it, I looked deep, and there was a good reason. So if you're going to go and look at the production of the Chinese companies between CNPC, CNOC, Sinopec, you, of course, see that CNPC is number one, Sinopec is number two, CNOC outside, and of course, Sinochem is emerging. And Sinochem is an oil trading company which now has refining assets and also upstream assets outside, storage assets. In China, it's very important for these companies to show themselves to be integrated. If they're not integrated, another of the big boys may gobble them up. Those of you who follow China might remember China National Star was uh, one of our clients, a very successful company upstream. One morning, doesn't exist anymore, became part of Sinopec. You have to say, you have to have refining, petrochemical, upstream at home, upstream abroad, and LNG. Now, Sinochem still doesn't have LNG, so they, they just want to get their hands into something too, so that they are now earn a seat at the table for being integrated domestically and internationally. And of course, these are, you know, uh, CNPC has 1.4 million employees. Sinopec is pretty small, 1.2 million employees. CNOC is really lean at 600,000 people. So when they register these companies, publicly uh, listed companies in Hong Kong and uh, New York, you put the good assets and a small number of people. So CNPC put 400,000 people in the public listed company, PetroChina. And all of the sort of liabilities, uh, social security system, they have to provide housing, medical, everything else is put in the parent company. So whatever profit they make, of course, these activities will go to the parent company and gets dumped into the system that they're committed to do. But for the shareholders, the value is only of the good parts, good assets of the companies. Now, gas, I want to say a few words in China. Gas is growing, is very important, and is growing very, very fast. But uh, starting with a very small roll, 3.5% uh, in 2009, used to be only 1% eight or nine years ago. And uh, we are expecting it to go to anywhere between 7 to 9% in the 2020. So it's still a huge growth, much bigger than hydro or nuclear, but uh, much smaller than oil and coal, of course. As we look towards the demand, sectoral demand, in China, the demand is industry, not power. Power is a secondary player. Uh, residential and commercial are likely to come, but they have to build the pipelines and reticulation system that they don't have. But it is coming. Today, the residential sector can pay you $12, $14 a million BTU. The pipe, the power sector cannot pay you much more th than six. So if you want to buy gas in China, <coughs> one of the state companies, they go to the government, the government gives you permission to do whatever you want, pretty much. You can buy at the price you want, but you cannot sell at the price that you want. You have to sell it at the prices which are mandated by the government. And the government has raised the prices in June 25%. This is the second increase uh, in two years. And they are uh, intending to keep raising it all the time. It won't reach the oil price, which are pretty much at the oil market parity, but they have become very realistic about subsidizing gas. The power sector in China still has problems paying higher prices. Industrial sector can do better. Residential can do much better. But there is very, as you can see, very minor 
residential system in place. Now, outlook for LNG imports, uh, this is, has a big impact on the global market, especially as uh, some of the exporters like Etahar, they say, well, if you don't buy from me, I just sell to the Chinese. Well, in, in China, the, the base case that we have is still quite radical. Uh, it's about uh, 40, 50 million tons of LNG. If you look at Japan being about 68 and probably looking at 75 or so, this is one thing that the Chinese will not overtake Japan. I mean, everything else already have overtaken, but in LNG imports, still I think Japan would be highest. Uh, now, high case, they can go near Japan, and low case would be based on pretty much whatever they have contracted or committed today. So they have already committed a lot and contracted a lot. So uh, since you can't fly this stuff in, you look at the terminals, policies, who is building, it's much easier to forecast in China and India than it is in other places, at least in the near term, because it takes so many years to build the terminal and the regasification facilities and develop the market. So this is our estimate that they will be a big player, but they would be second largest importer in the world after uh, Japan uh, exceeding Korea and Spain as the third and fourth player. In the old days, we thought the US would be the number one, but uh, that uh, is now sort of uh, taken 100 years or 850 years uh, delay. Uh, okay, let me switch to India. <coughs> India, fifth largest consumer of energy in the world, as compared to China number two. Very powerful system, but again, heavily dominated by coal. But in coal in India, there's a story which is untold, is that uh, coal is controlled by a union uh, which uh, is similar to what uh, Mexican oil unions used to be. They don't want anybody in the country. Okay, so because they don't want anybody in the country, they don't allow foreign investment in the coal sector. It is now clearly understood that if the foreign investment comes to the coal sector, coal production in India can go up a lot. Uh, but the government struggles with the sort of uh, mafia-type unions who will really try to stop any development uh, in India. I think things are changing. The changes will come, and there'll be more coal coming in India. But uh, India is busy outside buying everybody's coal. I mean, every time these Indonesians want to sell something, there are 15 bidders, and 12 of them are Indians. And they want to bring coal to India. So coal is still remains very high on the uh, radar in India, and they are very actively seeking worldwide acquisition of coal, as much as they are looking for acquisition of oil. Now, this is the structure of the oil and gas industry in India. Different, you have the crown jewels on top. This is Oil and Natural Gas Corporation of India. Indian, this is upstream company, which has one refinery in Mangalore. You have the Indian Oil Corporation and the National Thermal uh, Power uh, Company in, in charge of the essentially most of the state-owned power sector in India. And then you have the blue ones, which are kind of uh, secondary companies, government-owned. Hindustan Petroleum, Bharat Petroleum, Gas Authority of India Limited, and Oil India Limited, which is conveniently called oil. Uh, these are all state-owned companies. Uh, HPCL and BPCL are uh, downstream refining companies, which now have substantial assets. HP BPCL has a huge uh, position now in Brazil. They go international and trying to get assets. Everybody is there trying to buy upstream assets worldwide. And the government is in between. Uh, there are uh, lots of smaller players, subsidiaries in India, which operate. And uh, one of the interesting ones is Petronet, you can see on the left, which is owned by GDF International, Indian Oil, Gale, and Hindustan Petroleum. These guys essentially are in charge of the importation of um, uh, LNG into the main terminals. They are not the only ones, there's no monopoly, but they are the most important importer of uh, LNG into India. India. The government has uh, different in titles for them. Uh, uh, the established companies, the sort of uh, smaller companies, and the mini companies. And these are the smaller players which are in India. But uh, 
each of them very powerful. Now, in India, when the government controlled the price of oil and the companies were forced to lose money, unlike China, which gets a check at the end of the year, they got no check. They got a bond. And this is called the oil bonds. And these oil bonds have been issued for a number of years, now about 30, 40 billion dollars of them. Essentially, the government says, I issued a bond and the future generation will pay. And you know, sort of the public, they don't like these bonds because they think that somebody may say one day, what the hell have you done? All this amount of money you generated. So what happens was that the market started discounting the oil bond up to 25%. So the Indian government stepped in, buying the bonds back by the Reserve Bank of India, just so they can uh, sort of keep these companies whole. And of course, if you're a private company in India, then you have a big problem because you get no check from anybody. And this is why the big players like the Reliance people, they have been exporting and not selling in India because selling in India is just a guaranteed loss. But the export market will pay you more. So these things, with the price increases which came in the past two, three weeks, a lot of these issues now have started a new game. Still, I think the international market is better, but by marginal amount. Only kerosene and LPG remain heavily subsidized, but most of the other products are at or near the market. Now, if the price of oil jumps up from $80, $75 to $100, there'd be a problem. But if it stays at these levels, I think the Indians will be moving to reach the international market very shortly. Demand growth in India is sort of growing very fast. Uh, 3 million barrels per day, total petroleum consumption in India. And the production of oil in India is very low, much, much smaller than China. And so imports become bigger and bigger as time goes by. Now, if we look at uh, 2008 to 2000, April 2010, this is the time of the global recession, which did affect India. But the surge in diesel demand has been seen, uh, where the consumption grew by 8%. Then, on the gas side, Entry of uh, Krishna Godavari Basin gas from the famous D6 gas field has become a very important play. It has reduced NAFTA consumption alone by 16%, just this uh, new gas field. And incidentally, that gas is priced by the government edict at the price of uh, $4.20 at the landfall, which is just outside the offshore area, and is selling $7. So people paying a higher price for gas in India than uh, people are paying in the United States. And actually, the same in China, people pay higher price for gas in China than they pay in the United States. So we move in, I think, substantially to try to bring the gas and oil prices together towards the international market, while in the US, we've seen the oil and gas prices divorcing and going away from each other in the US market. Demand outlook for India, I think that uh, we, we see a revival of industrial manufacturing cent center. The fiscal stimulus in China and India have been very successful. A lot of transition from lower to middle income class. You see, again, all of the issues that you expect. Uh, and of course, the one lakh rupee car, $2,000 car, which is, uh, I've driven in it, and it's uh, not very fast. <laughs> but it does uh, protect you from uh, uh, rain and uh, kind of all of the negative air outside in Bombay if you want to be sitting in it. Um, 600 cc's only, so it's sort of it's a motorcycle with a box outside it. But for 2,000 bucks, uh, it seems okay. Uh, negative factors, again, some have slowed on GDP growth rate. They haven't gotten to the issue of saying, I want to have a limit on uh, my consumption yet. Substitution after by natural gas and fertilizer. And natural gas entry into India has changed the game in a big way. And it's a much more radical impact than the impact of things that we've seen in, in, in China. Improved efficiency in road transport and the fuel price reform. Essentially, they are moving towards the international market. And I think that this is a very positive step, step on both sides. I think the impact on demand in India will be more severe than the impact of demand of the higher prices in China. Now, I told you about India becoming uh, one of the largest global refining uh, markets. Uh, if the Indian growth rate is only 100, 150,000 barrels per day, they would be in surplus 15 more years. So a lot of the best refinery and the largest refinery in the world today is India. 
Who would have believed a refinery in India better than any refinery in the United States? And a lower cost and uh, fantastic management by Reliance Industries Corporation. Of course, they expected to come and export to the United States before things kind of uh, fell apart. And of course, uh, remember the old days uh, where people thought there's a huge refining capacity shortage in the US and build the refineries in the military uh, uh, camps and um, you know, sort of. Now, of course, everybody said, oh, these Americans, they can't make a refinery for themselves. So we build it and export it to them. And while everybody was ready to export, gee, we don't want it. We don't need it anymore. So part of the global surplus is the massive change which came in the United States itself. But India remains very big and part of it encouraged by government. Uh, as government in India believes that energy security is improved by having too much refining capacity. I'm not sure why, because if you don't have the crude, you don't still have, don't have the energy security. But um, there you have it. They are still building. Couple more major refineries still coming and India becomes a powerhouse as far as the refining industry is concerned. This is a list of the key projects which is being done. This is all in the next two, three years. A lot of new refineries are being built. And there is the strong case for price reform. I mean, if you look at the amount of money the government has put in, $21 billion last year. And now we are looking at a smaller subsidy of 10 billion, still is substantial. This is that the target is to bring it to less than 5 billion and eventually eliminate it. So, and you can see in terms of the uh, different products uh, that the, of course, kerosene has been heavily subsidized, domestic LPG heavily subsidized, diesel heavily subsidized. Sort of uh, gasoline, less of a subsidy they've received in terms of the total amount, but it has been across the board and this, I said, this recent price reform of uh, uh, June uh, put that uh, in a different context. Okay, uh, overseas investment. Um, ONGC Vidish, which is a subsidiary of uh, uh, ONGC in, in India, OVL, has now 40 assets in 16 countries. And the ad assets which are producing, include, including the Greater Nile oil project in, in Sudan, uh, Block 5A, Block 6-1 in Vietnam, Al Farat in uh, Syria. Uh, they are part of Sakhalin 1 consortium. They are all over the place, uh, of course, uh, also in Venezuela. And the place that uh, they wanted to be, but they are not very active now, is in, in Iran. ONGC, uh, bought Imperial Energy of UK and they're targeting 16 million tons of overseas oil and gas production. 60 million tons would uh, translate to about 1.2 million barrels per day, which is what China has today. So what India wants to have in 2025 is equal to what China has today. And as I mentioned, IOC, HPCL, BPCL are involved in international activities. Iran and Nigeria, substantial effort has gone into it, but nothing very much has materialized. And India has followed China by setting a site on Africa and Latin America, as well as Russia. But Africa and Latin America are now very high on the list. But whenever they get into competition uh, to with China, they lose. And the losses in China come because in China, the companies, the state companies, they don't need to get they need to inform the government about what they want to buy. They don't need permission. They have the money already. In India, everything they have to do, they have to ask. And so often it becomes a cabinet decision. By the time the cabinet says yes, Chinese have got it already. <laughs> so in that kind of competition, it's very difficult for anybody to compete with China. But the system flexibility has been put in there to give them authority to move forward as long as they operate within these huge budgets that they have. Natural gas demand, India different than China. Power is driving natural gas demand with industry being much cheaper. Residential and commercial the same way, but in India transportation of CNG gas has become very important. Any of you who have traveled in, in uh, Delhi and Bombay, you will see the public transportation all by CNG. 
And I remember I was in Delhi at the day of transition. They that they had to go to CNG from gasoline, and there were very few cars on the street. But one good thing about India, I don't know what the good thing or bad thing in India is, I don't want the same thing to be done in the US, but the decisions on environment are made by the Supreme Court. Okay? You go there and they will rule and there is no appeal, no discussion. Once they say it, you have to do it. And so there is a sort of a sort of terminal aspect of the decision. So when the government went and made appeals and I was assisting the government that this speed they wanted was too fast. They have to give it time. And we went to Supreme Court in India and they said, we've already ruled, we just haven't announced it, so no need for you guys to make a presentation. <laughs> and so we said, but this is not ready, this is all this. I have 300 transparencies and charts for you. They said, well, thank you very much. You can leave it with the clerk and register it and <laughs> decisions are made. So by George, they did it and it worked. <laughs> and it worked. The air in Delhi has improved significantly. And you know, some sort of, uh, bit of force here or there may have its own value. In uh, Bombay, it's been slower, uh, but pretty much all public transport has gone CNG. This is uh, not something which has happened in China. And of course, the CNG, remember, was based on the cheap $2.50 million BTU administered price of gas. Now that gas has been raised to $5 as of uh, two, three weeks ago. It's not so much fun anymore. Okay, now you have to, uh, end up giving a subsidy or somehow remove all taxes to make the CNG compete with gasoline. Uh, of course, uh, you know, one of the largest CNG users in the world is Iran, where there are thousands of service stations. But if the price of gas is nothing, CNG is an easy decision. But if the prices are high, then uh, you have to compare the oil market and make the decisions. Outlook for LNG imports, a uh, much smaller player than uh, China, but a significant global player. We're looking at uh, 15 million tons uh, uh, by 2020 and about uh, 20, 25 million tons afterwards. The sky is the limit. Again, remembering in China and India, if there is price of gas is cheap, there is no limit to demand. If the price of gas is high, there are lots of limits to demand. So when we do our analysis in China and India, we always do it under different price scenarios. So here, uh, assuming the price of gas remains cheap, of course, if the price of gas is cheap and Indians buy it all, it becomes expensive. So it doesn't work that way, but uh, the upper case could be very high. Uh, the upper case could be equal to the lower case or the base case of China. But India is an important player, and they have not paid any of the high prices for gas that China has paid. So they've been a lot more diligent in the negotiations over gas imports. Now, in terms of Iran, this is a list of uh, activities which are done by China in Iran. Uh, many, many activities. Uh, most important role, of course, that China has today is actually not in the upstream sector. It's in the downstream sector. In upstream, they famously discussed about the so-called Azadegan field, which uh, was uh, managed, uh, or the original contract was with uh, INPEX in Japan, and INPEX still hold the 10% share nominally, although they have gone totally. Uh, but the, the impacts plan uh, was pretty clear. I mean, you can go up first phase within three, four years to about 150,000 barrels per day, then go up to 250. This is with access to all technology, plenty of money being spent, and you need about seven years. So it isn't something that suddenly you can just produce a lot because now Chinese are there instead of the Japanese. It's just not done. So it is a high cost, expensive. Azadegan has a 30 billion barrel reserve, but a recovery of only 4 billion barrels. So one of the lowest recovery factors in the world because of the great complexity and difficulty of produ production. So whether in the future, future technologies can get more out of it, maybe, but. Uh, certainly at the moment, much smaller play. So the, the, the Chinese side, they have been active. And actually, they are really the only main players left in the country. Everybody else is gone. Uh, but the amount of contribution they have created for Iran in terms of exports, in terms of money, in terms of the 
uh, prestige is actually very, very small, very small. But in terms of uh, the downstream, uh, Chinese uh, activity Sinopec is now involved in development of the, one of the largest uh, uh, catalytic crackers in the world, in the Arak refinery, which is just outside of Tehran. This is around uh, 85,000 barrels per day, 90,000 barrels per day uh, cat cracker, together with the joint venture with the Iranian uh, consultants, very competent, and uh, I understand firsthand that this project is more than 70% complete. And by the end of 2011, it will be operational, adding between 75 to 85,000 barrels per day to the production capacity of gasoline in Iran. Now, there are uh, two other refineries in Iran which are also receiving uh, uh, catalytic crackers. Uh, one is in my hometown in Isfahan, and the one is in Abadan. They will be finished by 2012 or 13, and uh, combined, the Iranian gasoline production will go up by 200,000 barrels per day as a result of this. So sort of, uh, I think the sanctions policy would have been much more effective a few years ago, uh, not, not now. Uh, as you know, in, in, in Iran, there is a policy of smart cards, which gives a quota for each car. Now, I'll, I'll try to say the numbers uh, so that you can, in an easy way, so that you can remember. In Iran, 65% of gasoline consumption is domestically produced, and 35% is imported. So one-third has been imported before. Now, each car is given a smart card, which gives them um, 100 liters per month access. And if you want more than 100 liters, you can buy it from the service stations outside of the smart cards, for which you pay international price of about 50 cents a liter, as compared to 10 cents. So 500% price increase if you want to go in the outside of your quota, okay? So when the thing, everything is started, 96% of total consumption was subsidized and 4% was free market. Last year when I was here, I was predicting that the Iranian government is gonna reduce that 100 liters to lower volume using the threat of sanction by the US to justify their actions. So they went to 80 liters uh, per car, and this, immediately we expected a lot of that will mean that people will buy the 20 liters extra from the free market. Well, they didn't, they just cut the waste. <laughs> so it actually sort of increased efficiency. So the 4% went to about 6% or 7%, it almost doubled, but not substantially, because the rest of it is people just wasted because it was uh, so cheap. And uh, waiting desperately for the U.S. sanctions to be imposed on July 1, they reduced the sanction, they reduced the quota to 60 liters. So if your 100 liters was your mechanism before, now 40% of it is outside the subsidized rate. And if you have a two-third, one-third domestic production versus imports, it kind of tallies with that in a way. So now, uh, 60 liters uh, is the quota, and anything else you want to buy, you can buy with 500% premium. Well, the elasticity is really work, because the wastage is so large. Uh, in the month of uh, July, the first uh, two, three weeks of July, the imports in Iran has fallen by half compared to June. Of course, everybody can pat them on the back, themselves on the back, say, I did it. It's because everybody is scared of me. In the US, that's why they're not selling. Well, the Iranians, of course, have built huge inventory. But the fact is that the higher prices are reducing the demand themselves. And uh, I am a firm believer that international sanctions cannot impact flow of gasoline. Gasoline will flow. Now, it may not be so easy. The big players all will give it to somebody else who will pass it on. You can't stop the flow of gasoline unless you put uh, a naval blockade. Without that, it's not possible. The, for crude oil, it's much easier because only few big buyers. But uh, for gasoline, there are virtually thousands of suppliers. And uh, all the big boys will say, well, I'm not selling anymore. They're just selling to somebody else. 
and that somebody else can export to Iran or somebody else to another country. Uh, we don't know. But the reality is that this move to uh, a sl smaller uh, quota is going to significantly cut the requirement. So I think the, the, the number has gone down. It will go up a bit later on. But uh, I think the Iranian government would have saved several billion dollars in imports. And also, uh, the air will be much clearer. The, air, the government will get a lot of credit for less traffic. Uh, this is actually this is the best thing which could have happened to Iran anyway, with or without the Ahmadinejad government. So the government was forced to do something which was the right thing for themselves, but as a result of uh, an external threat which could be used to allow that to happen. As strong as governments could have been in Iran or in Indonesia under President Suharto, you raise the price of gasoline and you lose your job. Now you can raise the price of gasoline and you keep your job because you are worried about somebody else who can be the sort of the, the reason for your actions. Again, Chinese companies are not only involved in the development of oil and gas, they are key suppliers of upstream equipment in Iran and they face potential sanctions in that area. Uh, I mentioned about the Sinopec uh, in, in Iraq uh, and also the Persian Gulf Star, which is a condensate splitter. They haven't started building it yet because they're going to build this before because they needed to con convert the condensate from the South Pars field to gasoline. But kind of is not so urgent anymore because the, the demand is disappearing and the domestic refineries are coming up fast enough with the catalytic crackers to reduce the uh, import requirements. Uh, so essentially, China is very still heavily involved in Iran. Most of what they do, they don't make any money from. And the assumption is that they go there to be able to get crude. The buyback contracts will give them some cash, maybe some crude. But if they sell crude, it's going to go to Genrong. It's not going to go to themselves, because Genrong is the one which is authorized to import the first quarter of a million barrels per day from Iran. India, a lot less relationship. Uh, now, lots of people took credit for the US government to, to persuade the Indian government not to buy natural gas from Iran. It was not the US government. It was economics. Okay. If Reliance can produce the gas and sell it at $4.20 a million BTU at the landfall, and the customers hand by six, the Iranian gas would cost $13 plus in the Indian market. You have to be really crazy to go for that kind of deal. And the deal that Iran has signed with India, with, with Pakistan, and this is a firm deal, it's not a MOU, it's a firm sales and purchase agreement, would give at $80 oil about $9 a million BTU gas to Pakistan. Extremely expensive. Extremely expensive. And then they wanted to add two bucks for transit fee and two uh, uh, plus something else. Uh, uh, extra on top of it to give it to the Indian border, and then they had to put it in the HBJ pipeline in India, which would have been atrociously expensive for the consumer. So it was economics which killed it, not uh, arm twisting. Uh, the Pakistan deal is still is on. Iran is not building a pipeline to supply Pakistan. Build a, Iran is building a pipeline to supply itself. It's a domestic pipeline, which has been pla planned as I got nine for decades to bring the gas from Asaluye to Iran Shah, which is about 100 kilometers from the Pakistani border. And only the extension has to be built. And it's a 54-inch pipeline, so it can add 2, million, 2 billion cubic feet a day of extra gas in it. But remember, Iran today is a net gas importer. And we think the net gas imports to Iran will be maintained even if Iran exports to uh, Pakistan, because the additional requirements from Turkmenistan are there. And Iran is paying more to Turkmenistan in import of gas today than it can charge from Pakistan. So a lot of these things are for other reasons, right, than economics. I don't see Iran as a big gas exporter now or in the future, unless the domestic pricing system changes in a big way. And it's very di difficult to see that. One thing I have to remind you, know, you, we all know that the US is the largest consumer of gas in the world, and Russia is the second largest consumer. But Iran is the third largest consumer of gas in the world. Bigger than China, bigger than anywhere else in Europe, bigger than Japan. On the back of 10 cents to 30 cents a million BTU gas. 
You can't raise it because you paralyze the economy and people will die. It is as a result of Mr. Shiraz is here. He, first instance, before the revolution, he built the gas pipelines. Gas pipelines you built in the country were continued ferociously by the Islamic Republic. When you build it, you can't change the price anymore. You have to keep it. Because if you change the price, you create an implosion in the economy. So with the best of intentions, the government is hostage to bad macroeconomic policy. And uh, oil you can change, but gas you cannot. So in terms of the involvements, ONGC, OI, IOC were kind of uh, uh, fingers which shaken by the US government, Reliance uh, got the uh, finger shaken at them too. But Reliance did not renew its, its contract with an IOC. Uh, they have disagreements over buying up the heavy crudes from Iran also. But uh, the activities which are undertaken by both China and India as a sanction busting activities are pretty minor in the scheme of things. Really pretty minor. And, uh, you know, if we see the Iranians importing uh, energy, you can't say, oh, it's your fault, it's your fault, it's your fault. No, it's, it's, it, you, you have to begin to question the policy itself rather than the other people who are trying to bust it. And I think that uh, when you put everything together, uh, for Chinese, I think it's more sort of psychological, minor returns, and they need to be connected to resource owners. But uh, how much money they make, what they get out of it, is very small. And India has pretty much checked out. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, uh, Faridun. That was great and, and comprehensive. And so we really appreciate you uh, taking the time to walk through all those issues. I'd like to open it now for, for some questions. We have a couple of rules here at uh, CSIS. One is, if you would please, identify yourself and your affiliation, and uh, then also um, if you could make sure that when you end up whatever statement you're making, it has a question attached, that would be helpful as well, um, unless you'd like to start a, an argument that I'm sure Faridun would engage in that as well. Constructive criticism is also welcome. Oh, okay. Um, and I actually uh, I wanted to note that uh, I like your uh, comment about being hostage to bad macroeconomic policy. I think it's a lesson perhaps many other countries in the world could learn to uh, be aware of. Um, one thing I was going to ask you about to uh, follow up was the potential role for unconventional gas resources in both of these countries. Um, obviously, it's changed the dynamics of the U.S. gas market. We're hearing more and more about China's exploration for uh, shale gas and the potential there. India has tremendous uh, coal deposits and potential for coal bed methane. And we're seeing for the first time uh, coal bed methane in Australia being actually used to support an LNG project, which I would have never thought would have happened. So I was just wondering if you'd like to, uh, ha if you have any comments on whether or not we can expect these resources to come into play in a, in a major way, or maybe what the time frame for that is. I think in China, coal bed methane already is huge and becomes bigger and bigger. I mean, we have very bullish forecast of coal bed methane inside of the Chinese system. In India, it's a little bit hostage to the same unions who don't allow foreign investment. If you produce more coal, then you have more coal bed methane. But if you don't produce the coal, then it's not there. I expect that it becomes bigger and bigger in India also. And uh, now that coal bed methane, I mean, I think beyond the two of them, also Indonesia is a place without a 200 TCF of coal bed methane could be available to them. So coal bed methane becomes a very, very important part of the total system. Now. In, in, in some shale gas, there are large uh, geological uh, areas in China which has um, shale gas. Uh, people have, are, are surprised that the Chinese are not rushing to do it. And actually, there is an official statement in China that we produce two BCF a day by 2015, which is absolutely impossible to do. Because, you know, so the first, I mean, uh, it, it's, if they started a year ago, they couldn't do it. Uh, it's a timing issue. The whole of the system is still being evaluated. Uh, they have a partnership with Shell, and Shell also quite bullish that they could do a production, uh, reasonable production costs uh, also. But, you know, they also, if you, if you go back, there are 15 licenses given by China uh, just to Shell for coal gasification. 
and lots of uh, coal liquefaction. Lots of these things have been signed, but nothing has happened. And the reason nothing has happened is that they have to evaluate if the economics works out. On the coal side, it's easy if they do all the coal. One million barrels per day of oil they produce from coal, then they have to import coal from everywhere else. So they go short of coal. It is, you can't keep your one side constant and then convert it from one side to another side. You would have to have a global balance change. I think shale gas will come. Uh, my guess is that it's going to be post-2020. And uh, my guess is that the cost would be pretty steep, that uh, it will not be much lower than the uh, LNG prices in the 8 to $10 range. Uh, but it's all guesses, because they have not done the evaluation. They haven't drilled one well yet. You have to go this, you know, start digging evaluating and then building the infrastructure to receive it. The Chinese have built more pipeline in the past 10 years than they built in the past 40 years. But to create a system, I mean, you know, in the US, it's really quite fantastic, you know, just get something out and put it in the grid and it goes, you know, sort of, as long as the government regulators and the environmentalists allow you to do it, I mean, you have, you don't have the need to create a whole infrastructure. They would have to create a whole infrastructure. And this is, I think, what's holding back. It's going to be slow, relatively expensive, but uh, they'll do it. So we do have microphones. So when you, um, uh, if you could wait just a second until the microphone comes so that we uh, can pick it up on the, the web broadcast as well. So we have one question on the side here. Hi, uh, Cliff Kupchin with Eurasia Group. Um, first, just a, a comment. It seems to me that increasingly the threat that China faces as far as securing supply from Iran is not U.S. energy sanctions, but financial sanctions. The, the, the news seems to be uh, being closed around banks, and the prospect of how China would settle accounts seems to be coming into play. Um, two questions. First, um, short. Um, North Azadegan and Yadavadan. From what I can tell, China is active there. How small is that? Um, um, and secondly, um, and slightly on a different topic, um, the Europe EU is going to announce new sanctions on Monday. Um, it will ban both technical assistance and equipment sales to Iran of any kind. Uh, are there European IOCs still involved in that, even though they're not in the upstream, and how much will that hurt Iran? Thanks. I think that uh, in terms of the if I want to measure what sanctions are hurting Iran, the U.S. sanctions are just nothing. I say U.N. sanctions are nothing. Uh, U.S. sanctions have been less effective than the Treasury arm twisting. The Treasury arm twisting has been very effective. And I think in so far as what has really hurt is the people in black suits visiting you and telling you if you do this, then um, something uh, you and your cousins will never be allowed in the U.S., and your houses, uh, your properties will be seized, which essentially this has had a huge impact. And a lot of the uh, top officials, CEOs of banks, CEOs of the contracting companies, after one visit, they kind of essentially pulled out. So uh, that, I think, is very uh, effective. And that, that has, I think, been the most important and uh, sort of powerful part of the sanctions. The current set of sanctions in the U.S. are making life difficult. Uh, but uh, they are not on their own going to bring the system to knees. I think the gasoline sanction actually has a minor impact. Uh, but the European sanctions are quite serious. And they, in, indeed, they may stop all the Iran air flights out, outside of Iran. It is quite, quite a serious issue which uh, uh, I think the government in Iran is brushing it off as nothing. It's another one part of, you know, propaganda will do what we want. But the already the realization was so severe in this area that uh, the, uh, Mr. Musa, the leader of opposition, uh, last week said, you know, let's have a referendum on the nuclear issue. Do we want it? Do we want this nuclear power plant? I mean, at the end of the day, remember, Iran adds 3,500 megawatts of electricity every year to its grid. This is only 1,000 megawatts, which has been going on up to years. I mean, it makes it's nothing. It's a drop in the bucket. 
while they're arguing about this, they've added 40,000 megawatts already to the system, and they are still arguing about 1,000 megawatts. So the sort of the, the system inside of Iran now so worried about the European sanctions that they question to the level that they're asking for a referendum. Three, four years ago, if somebody asked for a referendum, the government would say, let's do it. And the referendum would be 70, 80% in the favor of uh, continuing. Not today anymore, with the system imploding from inside. And, uh, you know, people talk about the problems of energy secu security with Iran. It's not a nuclear issue. It's a domestic implosion, which, and a potential chaos after that, as there is no organized opposition, which is, I think, the problem, in my view. Uh, but in, in that way, I think that the European sanctions issue becomes a serious issue. The European companies today, they are, uh, they have one toe there, but nobody's doing anything. Uh, one of the largest new discoveries, uh, which was made by Statoil, uh, actually by Old North Kidro, which is part of Statoil, the Anaran field in Iran, 100,000 barrels per day, easy oil. They just abandoned it. They said, I don't want to do it. So there's no problem, we give it to the Chinese. Everything said, no problem, we give it to the Chinese. The Shell and Total essentially walked away from the LNG projects. Said, okay, we give it to the Chinese. So uh, some of these things the Chinese cannot do. They don't have the technology. Some of them they don't want to do. Uh, so I think that although there are still Europeans having offices there and some of the discussions continue as they see after investing 20 years, they don't see that they should walk away. They should just sit there and wait until something happens. But effectively, I think that uh, there is nothing going on from the European side in Iran. And the Chinese side also a minor. So the Iranian oil production is now in a sort of decline. Uh, the decline rates are high. This, the decline is about 400,000 barrels per day a year. And they, had to use, they have to add 400,000 to stay in the same place. They can't do it. So you have 100 to 200,000 barrels per day of decline in capacity, which uh, over a five, eight, seven period, period of time would put the production, the exports uh, well over under three million barrels per day. And then um, easily can go to two, less than two billion barrels per day. I mean, I Iran is losing its position while Iraq is gaining. And of course, Iranians are very, very competitive in terms of the oil production with Iraq. But you see one side going up and one side coming down. So uh, these things, I think, this time is different. This time, I think, sanctions creates internal discord in a much bigger way rather than creating a, a force behind the government supporting them because they are um, uh, under pressure. How much is produced? Uh, Gan, as I mentioned, the, the INPEX plan was 150,000 going to 250. At the moment, only 50,000 barrels per day is produced, and this is from the, what they call experimental wells, unsustainable at this stage. Yadavaran is a much bigger field. Yadavaran can go to between 250,000 to 300,000 barrels per day. And that is uh, not producing yet, but is in full swing. As far as I understand, it should be operational within a year or two. It's a large field. And uh, the other one, which is next to it, Jofair, which was given to the Indians. Indians walked away. It was given to Belarus Naft, which is a great exploration <laughs> company in the world. But, uh, first time now you see them ex international exploration. <laughs> but it's not different from Petro Vietnam in uh, Venezuela. Okay, we have a question here, and then we'll take one over on this side after that. Uh, I'm Bart uh, MA student from uh, University of Nevada, Reno. Uh, when we consider the security, uh, energy security, China tries to build uh, secure pipelines. The example, uh, sino Central Asian pipelines. Uh, actually, China achieved that. Uh, uh, successfully the Turkmenistan uh, China pipeline natural gas pipeline and uh, ongoing Kazakhstan China pipeline so when we can consider that uh, how China will affect the uh, future energy development of Caspian basin and uh, how it will affect the energy security of uh, European uh, countries thanks okay I mean, uh you have pipelines and you have pipe dreams. Some of these things are, are dreams, some are pipelines. But you have uh, the, the pipeline from uh, Gazakhstan to China is real, it's working. And they're gonna be increased in, in size and uh, some uh, volume of Russian oil already is in the system and may be increased. So that one and the Turkmenistan pipeline are real and operating. 
the pipeline from uh, Burma to China will be completed soon, and uh, that will be natural gas from Burma to, to, to China. Uh, the Russian pipeline bringing oil uh, from uh, eastern uh, Siberia to China also in full swing. It will come, hasn't come yet. And for the first time, Russia will be connected directly to uh, China uh, outside of the railway system, which has been dedicated uh, export system. So I think, yes, uh, the, the pipelines continue. The, the, the does it affect the development of the Caspian oil and gas? I don't know. I mean, everybody will produce whatever they want to do anyway, and China is one of the buyers, but not the biggest buyer by any means. You don't produce just for China because you can't fly it to China. You have to have a mode of transportation, and transportation uh, very expensive, takes time. You have to de plan a decade in advance, uh, size the right uh, amount of inches of the pipeline to be able to get the volume in. Um, more gas from Russia, from um, the Kovitka area, I think is certainly possible, but uh, slow. So China has to follow a policy of uh, diversified supply from anybody who has volumes, from pipeline, from ships, uh, from uh, LNG, natural gas pipelines. Uh, all of these things have to be followed simultaneously. So the plan is a comprehensive plan but one is not at the expense of the other. It's not like Europe that you say, well, okay, if you bring in LNG, you don't have to buy Russian gas tank, for example. The Chinese need all of it, and they are prepared to pay the international prices, slowly have accepted the realities, and uh, I think they have a reasonable sort of clear line of what they want to import from where, some great ambitions in the future, uh, but I think many of them will become reality. Hossein of News of International Petroleum Enterprises. Thank you so much for the informative talk. I share um, your views on many of the aspects of Iran's petroleum industry, uh, but you, uh, you keep um, promising uh, a major decline in Iran's uh, production. Uh, I think four or five years ago, you were the first analyst. Imports, you mean. Not production, imports. Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, crude oil production. Crude oil production. Oh, okay. and, yes, and yes. gas as well. Yes, yes. Um, on the uh, uh, gas, you mentioned that uh, Iran would not be able to, to export any gas. You were very negative on uh, the possibility of exporting to Pakistan as well, if I recall correctly. But it, it happened. Uh, you know, at least the contract has been signed. Um, and Iran has really many options. Iran can inject the gas, can use it for petrochemical, as they have done. In fact, since the end of the war, uh, Iran-Iraq war, uh, Iran's uh, production of uh, chemical and petrochemical products has gone up by like 50 or 60 fold. So there, there are many options for Iran. It's not just uh, you know, the gas sales uh, to, to other countries. But on the oil side, you also modified your position. Five years ago, you were talking about 500,000 barrels per day uh, decline. Now you revised it to 100 to 200,000. No, 400, I said. Uh, 400 decline, and then you, you, you have declined and you have increased. So I said the net loss right. of uh, well, 100. Of this course, is about so the same as I said last natural, year. natural, but when you talk about the total decline, is, is including your your new, uh, you know, wells and new fields and so on. But in any rate, uh, you know, during the past several years, uh, prices have been higher, sanctions have been tightened, uh, Iran has developed new ways to reduce the demand, and they also have many problems with the gas injection. So the impact of all these factors have been very favorable to, to your, you know, viewpoint, and yet we haven't really seen much of a decline. In fact, right now, Iran's export, Iran's uh, total production is limited by the quota that was imposed by OPEC rather than its total capacity or its wishes, you know, the level of uh, the production that the country wants to, uh, wants to uh, produce and export. Uh, are you confident in those uh, uh, figures that you, that you have now with the uh, total net impact on the, uh, on the production? And 
does, does Iran really need to emphasize on oil when they have substantial amount of reserves uh, of, of natural gas? And in fact, there, there seems to be a shift of direction, you know, development of, of gas instead of oil. Do they really need to produce that much oil? Thank you. Okay. I think uh, some of the things I said you may have misunderstood because when you talk about natural decline, you don't talk about net natural decline. You talk about gross natural decline. We say natural decline in Saudi Arabia is six or seven hundred thousand barrels per day, and uh, which is sort of publicly accepted. So that doesn't mean that Saudi Arabia's production capacity is falling by six or seven hundred thousand barrels per day. So you you have a natural decline. OPEC has a natural decline of one point two million barrels per day, or 1.5 a year and has to add that much to stay even. So in the case of Iran, they were losing four or 500,000 barrels per day before. And actually, the 500,000 barrels per day is quoted by Minister Zangene personally. And he said on TV, somebody interviewed him. He said, Dr. Fischaraki says that our decline is 500,000 barrels per day. These are exaggerated, aren't they? He said, no. That's exactly what the number is. This is quoting from the minister on Iranian TV. The issue was that before, they were adding four or 500,000 barrels per day every year, so the decline actually was zero. Now, because they are not able to add, because of the sanctions, because of the lack of financing, because of a variety of other issues, there is a net decline of 100, 200,000 barrels per day. So let me clarify so there is no misunderstanding. I had never expected, if, if Iranian capacity falls by 500,000 barrels per day in two or three years, they can go to uh, <laughs> two million barrels per day or one million barrels per day export. So that's sort of, uh, it's a gross, number, not a net number. You are right in terms of natural gas options. Iran has actually, the reason Iran is in the predicament it is as a net gas importer is because of the domestic pricing policies. If domestic prices changed, Iran would be, could be a huge export and could do a lot of things. But one of the reasons that Iran has failed to export, for example, LNG, is not only the international sanctions, but the poor design of the projects. In Qatar, when you export LNG, you have upstream, downstream negotiation all in one hand. You have Qatar gas, Ras gas. In Iran, upstream was in parcel oil and gas company. Downstream, on NIGEC, which has become part of NIGC. NIGC then does all the pipelines. So if one of them in between could not do the job, the system collapsed. So it was not because it wasn't there. One was the poor terms that were offered. Second was the poor way the system was organized. But uh, yes, Iranian requirements for injection at the minimum is bigger than total Qatari LNG exports. These are huge numbers, minimum. 10 BCF a day, no, 10 is now official plan in Iran. But actually, if you talk to Dr. Saidi, that you know very well, people like that uh, who are old exper experienced uh, reservoir engineers, they say you need 20 billion cubic feet a day. All of South Pars has to go. So sort of the options are great. Options, reinjection, CNG in Iran, very big. If you have gasoline problem, why import it? Convert the natural gas to, to CNG. And of course, petrochemicals have also grown by leaps and bounds. And uh, less of a focus of international sanctions on petrochemicals uh, than uh, it's been. So a lot of foreign investors have actually come in in there. So the options are great, it's just managing them properly, which has been the problem. Pastor Schaefer. Tazy Schaefer from CSIS. I'm interested in your comments on how the big change in both India and uh, China was in their pricing policy and moving closer to international pricing. Both countries if I remember rightly, seem to be trying to rely a lot on captive sources of, captive international sources of oil on in investing upstream. Does the change in pricing policy suggest uh, that they are moving away from this essentially mercantilist approach towards one that looks more at the market as a single source of whatever it is they need to import? Well, I think you put it in a complicated way, which I'm not sure whether I can, uh, I can answer in a simpler way. A simpler way is that they saw the light, essentially. You cannot continue to be a huge player in the international market 
and regulate prices significantly underneath the international prices, the national market. You realize the folly of the activities that you keep buying more and more yourself, and then you actually damage yourself if you are so big. And you know, if you look at the past few years, I mean, more than 50% of the global incremental demand has been China. You add China and India, that's two thirds of the global demand growth. And you say, okay, I just continue isolating myself from the international market. You are essentially doing yourself in. Plus, uh, you develop all these companies uh, which uh, survive on exporting products, and they are uneconomic themselves. So now China says, you know, maybe a state-owned company, but you make a deal and you lose money. Don't come to me. Ask them. So you do your due diligence before. Don't assume that because they're a state company, I'm going to protect them. And I think that's been a very important uh, change, both in China and India. So the issue of getting towards the market is more for moderating domestic demand, for allowing the industries which get into the export or domestic market to understand economic realities, and to be able to be a global player in the international market in all the products that you produce. And uh, you don't want somebody to say, OK, you, you subsidize your domestic prices, and that's how you can beat me in the international market. <coughs> they realize that it's good for them. And they realize this approach of being part of the global market actually beneficial for themselves. I think that's really the incentive for them to do the right thing. Thank you. I think we have time for one or maybe two short questions. So I see two hands. So you, you guys will get to take this question here first. And why don't we take? Why don't we get both questions on the floor before you answer? Thank you, sir. Tony in Constellation. Um, question. Essentially, a follow-up question. What you talked about where um, it seems like China's policy right now is some sort of contradiction where you talked about China has to diversify their energy sources. But um, if they go out and try to acquire, uh, let's say, upstream assets, they don't have the technology to do that or advanced technology. They buy the companies, let's say the US, uh, Congress certainly is not gonna approve that or other European countries. Um, to, uh, and also domestically, if they keep con continue producing coal and coal fire generation, they're going to suffocate to death because right now you can't really breathe over there. And so um, how are they, why are they still sort of taking their time to develop some of the other domestic sources like natural gas and, and as long as when, let's say, they develop the west or inland areas, then they have even greater demand. And essentially also the price control is more relaxed than India already. So it seems like they have this uh, ferocious need for supply, but it seems like where are they getting all of that? So any prescription on, the, on China's the energy policy going forward? Thank you. And then we'll get the other question out. And <laughs> Caitlin McGovern from Stat Oil. Um, I just had a question in reference to the shale gas that David was referring to in China. We're seeing a lot of European companies go in. You had mentioned Shell and a lot others are at the table negotiating. Why do you think the Americans are slow, so slow to the table? Is it more of a U.S. policy dynamic or just slower corporate agendas in America? Well, the American company is kind of busy with <laughs> themselves. <laughs> you know, sort of, I mean, uh, uh, I think the international majors look at everywhere. I mean, if you're at Chesapeake, you're kind of busy at home and, you know, sort of, uh, um, I, I, I really sort of, don't see any kind of policy impact here. You know, the government has no say on these things anyway. Or do they? No. Well, I, mean, I thought they don't have a say on this we kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> won't tell you. Uh, but I think that uh, still, first stage is that you have to do some evaluation of how much is there and what is there. We don't know that yet. We still don't know what is there. It's all kind of uh, it's very preliminary. Uh, but if something is good, the Chinese will do it themselves. Remember, if there is something profitable, they will give a bit to the foreigners and keep the rest of it themselves. So uh, I, don't, I don't see there is need for too many people. There is nobody in upstream in China except for themselves because they don't need to. And then that ties into the country. Now, I think it's a mistake to believe the Chinese don't have the technology. They are pretty good at the technology. They may not be as good as some of the American companies on some of the sophisticated uh, process technologies, but they have the technology. And I'm not sure exactly what your question was, really, uh, because in, in a way, 
the Chinese, they have a huge economy. They have to do many things at the same time. And uh, when they wanted to buy European companies, nobody said anything. So only in the US you say something about these things. And if you swallow something big, I mean, if they want to buy BP, the British government may have something to say. But if you want to buy imperial oil, uh, who cares? You know? and if they didn't want to buy Unical and the US wanted to buy a, a small player, I don't know whether anybody would have cared to try to interfere with it. It was the case of Unical was an exceptional, poorly handled, and very strong Washington lobby effort, very successful, which resulted in that, uh, that not necessarily repeatable. But I think in the case of China, they have technology, they have ability, but they follow a multiple strategy. Uh, and they try to do the best they can with, within all these problems. Now, you mentioned something like about strong demand inland in China or Western province, Western China. Western China has the slowest, smallest demand growth. And in, inland areas also are, uh, the demand growth is not great. Most of the demand is in the coastal areas. But uh, in China, any supply issue which can be handled will be handled. No left stone is left unturned, but there's the speed and the focus. And people say, well, why are the Chinese rushing on the shale oil? Well, they're kind of busy with other things. I mean, there are lots of priorities. Somebody asked, well, why don't the Chinese have hybrid cars? I mean, you know, they worry about consumption. Well, they'll get to it. It's, it's on the plan, and already they're building some, but they're kind of uh, busy with other things. So. For this huge country with the huge and multiple problems that they have, I think they're doing a pretty good job. So that would be the nature of your advice to the Chinese government? You're doing a pretty good job? You're doing a pretty good job. I just focus on um, some issues more than the others. Okay. Great. Well, join me in thanking Faradun for a great presentation.